Real quick, my fire starters, I've got a question for you. You ever trip over some media that speaks so perfectly to you that you can't imagine how it escaped you after all these years? I've had it happen before. Dark was a recent television example with its town full of secrets mixed with primer style time travel, but even that was more of a pleasant surprise, a blip in the programming of Netflix that showed my interest falling more in line with someone else's. No, this happened this year with a movie from the mid-aughts. Well, if I'm going to be accurate, it was an hour-long episode of a long defunct series called Masters of Horror. Now, to be fair, fair. To, be fair. To, be fair. to be fair, to be fair, to be fair, I'd watched this when it was originally on Showtime, but never saw all the episodes. The few I saw had stayed with me and would be brought up casually in conversation, along with the initial entries in the eight films to die for theater experiments around the same time. I'm sure they've even been brought up in one of our podcasts a time or two. Masters of Horror was a horror anthology series brought together by Mick Garris after a series of dinners with classic horror directors starting in 2002. What was great about these episodes is that it allowed these masters to get back in the game, to play with a limited budget and do the stories they couldn't get made into full films. These were passion projects, and as a result, we received 26 hour long interesting films. And if you've been here for any appreciable amount of time, you know that I'm so very attracted to more interesting than good. However, I'm not here to talk about the series as a whole. I'm here to talk about one particular episode done by one of my favorite directors, John Carpenter. You see, some of the best horror movies I've glommed onto were done by Carpenter, above all his Apocalypse trilogy. The Thing is a damn near perfect film, and I've seen it way too many times to count. For my birthday last year, Nathan of Difficulty Concentrating, at Nawad Neutron, got me a seemingly innocuous horror DVD. I put it aside, meaning to watch it, but wasn't breaking down the door to see it since I've seen a few Masters of Horror and they just hadn't wowed me. But one day when I figured it was worth to try this shot in the dark, I was shocked to find that John Carpenter's Cigarette Burns was created specifically to cater to my obscure tastes and was an amalgamation of everything I've covered on this channel so far. Before we get started, I wanted to thank my patrons, Chris Markinson, Jeff Strait, Stormy OK. Even though it's been a minute, you have helped me keep focused and wanting to do better. Also, spoilers for the following. Cigarette burns. Duh. We'll also be discussing some dark and twisted stuff, as usual, but just be warned. If you want to support us, make sure to check out our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Justin B. Heard. For a dollar per video, you can get your name announced at the beginning of each of my videos, further tiers including getting my scripts as I write them, and even getting to choose your own topic for me to cover. Make sure to like this episode, or I'm going to set you on fire. Doesn't that sound lovely? So without further stalling, here's a comprehensive look at Masters of Horror Season 1, Episode 8, Cigarette Burns. Oh, and this is Dubious Consumption. Absolute du monde. The absolute end of the world. What do you know about it? I know it played once. Opening night premiere of the Festival International de Cinema Fantastique des Sitges. Violence erupted in the theater. When Hans Bakovit, the director, tried to get it out of the country, the government seized it and destroyed it, not realizing it was a work in progress and his only print. My elevator pitch for this episode is, what if the Ninth Gate, House of Leaves, and 8mm had a love baby? Those three, along with my love of True Detective, came together to create this interesting gem. By now you've probably recognized Norman Reedus, as well as Udo Kier. Obviously The Walking Dead's Daryl is a huge catch, years before he'd really hit his stride. Udo Kier is an old master when it comes to horror fare, though my main reference for him is Marvel's Amazing Blade. But if you go way back, he was also Andy Warhol's Dracula. God, if you haven't seen that movie, you're in for a treat. Whether you're a fan or not, they shine in this odd episode. Cigarette Burns is about a film detective who is hired by an eccentric millionaire who is hunting for a long forgotten film, La Fin Absolute de Monde, or The Absolute End of the World. Like The Yellow King, it drives its viewers to violence and insanity. It has disappeared, building a cult like following over 30 years as those enraptured view search for any glimpse of the sublime destruction. As you get closer and closer, these fiery cigarette burns appear in your vision, causing blackouts, violence, and hallucinations. But then again, what's one or two deaths if you're letting Ambien take the wheel? Whereas the Ninth Gate plays with the line between mysticism and reality, 
Cigarette Burns immediately throws us into the world of magical realism by bringing in a subdued angel with its wings removed. It reveals that its soul is bound to the film. So the film still exists somewhere. Honestly, I'd say this addition adds little to the overall tone of the piece. It works as a great way to let us know immediately that we're not dealing with the real world, but what captures my imagination is how real the film feels. Instead, Cigarette Burns plays more like 8mm Kill List or even In the Mouth of Madness, once again touching on John Carpenter's love of apocalyptic objects. In the original script, the film itself was more magical, with the ability to teleport around to be where it was needed at any time. It's thanks to John Carpenter's involvement that the writers Drew McWeeney and Rebecca Swan tone down the fantastical approach to the film. Instead, they focus more on the mythology, make it a tangible thing, that there's a line from where it started to where it ended up. While I'm not going to go into every scene in the episode, I like to bring up some of my favorite moments. First and foremost, I love the way they bring in characters that have been affected by the film. We run into a historian who tried to watch the film at a private viewing, but turned away only to have his fingers fused together by trying to stop the film once the violence had started. The highlight for me, however, is one that ties into House of Leaves, Norman Reedus' Kirby Sweetman tracks down a film reviewer, A.J. Myers, who saw the original screening and managed to escape the death and carnage it left in its wake. He has the only review out, a small blurb that lauds La Fin Absolute de Monde, but the reviewer has disappeared since then. When Kirby finds the critic in a rundown house surrounded by stacks of loose pages, A.J. is hard at work at the typewriter, not stopping at all as he describes his experience with the film. Through the conversation, we realize that these mountains of paper is A.J.'s full review for the film, which he hadn't been able to achieve. There is such a delicious insanity on display here, and I could totally transplant Zampano into this role, a perfect opening to the editing insanity that House of Leaves brings to the table. And that's one of the best things about this episode. The creators are clearly fans of film in all its form. For one, it's mentioned that he was Pauline Kael's greatest student. For the uninitiated, Pauline Kael was a film critic who was fundamental in reshaping the way we critically talk about film using the form to bring in a personal side that hadn't been seen before she came along in the early 50s. To even bring her name into the fray shows McWeeny and Swan's dedication to film itself in all its aspects. As I said, this film plays with similar themes to 8mm, including a section where sadomasochistic snout film creators talk about how important the cut is in the creation of art. He demonstrates this the only way he knows how, by brutally murdering a woman in front of a camera. And like all good deus ex machinas, the cigarette burns come in to save Kirby when he really needs it. As explained in the film, cigarette burns were essential for booth operators to know when to change the reel. Fight Club obviously has one of the most memorable sequences explaining this very phenomenon. If you look for it, you can see these little dots come into the upper right hand corner of the screen. In the industry, we call them cigarette burns. In cigarette burns, however, we have Sweetman's assistant, Timpson, cutting those original indicators out of film prints collecting them from the classics that pass through their little theater. In the context of the episode, anyone who gets close to the film, whose obsession grows ever more dangerous, experiences these cigarette burns in their vision right before they black out. From what we see, that lost time is extremely violent and a portent of the darkness they're playing with. It leads Kirby to his most violent outbursts. Huh? Fuck you, psycho! <laughs> Please. Lastly, my favorite sequence of events was after the fateful film had been discovered and dropped off. Kirby leaves as quickly as he can, only to get called back after his father-in-law has locked up the theater. He gets there to discover, well, let's just say some of the imagery would fit very comfortably within the Event Horizon universe. We're leaving. This includes a lovely section where Udo Kier's eccentric collector has fed his intestines into a projector in a futile attempt to make his own movie. I have been inspired. I made my own movie. Perhaps the most interesting aspect of Le Fin Absolute de Monde is that it's a reflection of the viewer. Not only does it drive the crowd to violence and insanity, but it also tailors its specific madness to you and only you. While the stills themselves show a fever dream similar to German Expressionism, what it produces is a phantom from Sweetman's past, one that he's not been able to let go. More on that later. If this trope seems familiar, it's because it's a core tenet of existential horror. The knowledge that we are insignificant in the universe, and if we tripped over an artifact, an entity, a god, we'd lose our minds just by having the faintest glimmer of its knowledge. This commonly falls into tropes such as the brown note, a sensory input that is inherently harmful, the mind virus, a virus of the mind that, unlike normal viruses, doesn't cause any physical symptoms. Instead, it alters the way its victims think. 
go mad from the revelation. Experiences that are so horribly mind-shattering that the usual result is stark raving madness. All these fall under the umbrella of eldritch horror. What I find so interesting about all of this is that some of our favorite horror creations, or even side entries that dabble in it, fall into these quite frequently. I've even mentioned quite a few of them in this video, as well as covered them in this channel. However, the granddaddy of them all was The King in Yellow. Robert W. Chambers' The King in Yellow was released in 1895 and is most recognizable from H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulhu Mythos. In 1927, Lovecraft came across Chambers' work and took a liking to the concept of Haster and Carcosa. Soon thereafter, he took the names and created a great old one, the half-brother of Cthulhu. In these initial stories, however, there's a play that, if you even glimpse the second act, it will drive you irrevocably insane. Man, do I love that phrase. In that same way that Lovecraft co-opted Chambers' Yellow King, Chambers borrowed the concept of Carcosa from another author, Ambrose Bierce. This, however, was more the names being used to represent something completely different. For the uninitiated, the cornerstone I always go to when explaining Lovecraftian creations is Guillermo del Toro's Hellboy. You know those giant tentacle beasts that are just floating out in space, taking a snooze? Yeah, that's an Elder God. It being so unimaginably evil and ancient that just waking would destroy all life in the universe. So, there's that. What's interesting about the King in Yellow short stories is that they all twist and turn around this play, dealing with different aspects of this alternate history slash future. In the first story, it's especially intriguing since it's set in 1921, predicting but also getting wrong issues with Germany, which is all the more odd since the book came out 25 years beforehand. Reading it now, there's the, almost this whiplash that strikes you as you're both cognizant of its inaccuracies but marveling at what was correct. The rest of the stories have at least the shadow of the King in Yellow draped over them, becoming an inspiration for the likes of Stephen King with this universe held together by the existence of this play. Eldritch's concepts were established here, only made popular decades after with Lovecraft's adoption of these tropes. Before I let you go, I want to talk about the themes of cigarette burns and why I love this genre. But before I can, let's get some fire started. Be sure to set Fire to the Hive by mashing the like, share, and subscribe buttons. Honestly, it works far more in my favor than you would think in getting my latest videos out there. If you hit that bell, it'll let you know as soon as my new videos are out. You can also support us on Patreon. I can tell you from experience that I make more there in one video than I do for an entire month of being monetized right now. That really opens your eyes once you start seeing that. As always, you can find me on justindherd.net and at justindherd on Twitter. Cigarette Burns' narrative hinges on the inability to let go, that sometimes the past is best left forgotten, unexamined. All the characters have some form of ghost haunting them, starting with Kirby and his late girlfriend's father, Walter, and their inability to get over the death of Annie. From even that starting point, everything is a reminder of how this obsession slowly destroys everything it touches. Even though several characters had brushes with death as a result of this film, they all want to touch that darkness one more time to dwell in the mania that it promised. For me, that's part of the most fascinating bits of these Eldritch stories, that the thing they seek will destroy them, and they know it. It crosses dangerously close to one of my other favorite genres, the obsessive crime drama, where trying to solve that one case ends up breaking the person who started out just looking for the truth, and instead their lives are destroyed in the process, losing everyone they cared about. But they just can't stop. It's not a problem. I'm just down in the basement. Come in, Mr. Graceman. In The King in Yellow, these short stories create a text and a god that destroys the person's mind, regardless of how strong they are. In the end of Cigarette Burns, Herbie loses himself once more, caught watching the fatal film. In his psychosis, he realizes that his late girlfriend, a heroin addict that committed suicide, is being kept alive in his memories, and in order to let her spirit rest, he has to kill both her grieving father and himself. And like so many cosmic horrors, no one escapes this encounter alive. Instead, the tormented angel who kept this conquest alive recovers the film and thanks the recently deceased Kirby for his assistance. Like the lament configuration in the first Hellraiser, the object of destruction is recovered by otherworldly creatures and, well, we don't know. We can only assume that it will be released into the wild to torment future knowledge seekers. And perhaps that's the thing I love most about these stories, perhaps about horror itself. The evil doesn't stop. In one way or another, it's going to be released again destroying another small community, then disappear once more. That's why stories such as Hellraiser, The Cabin in the Woods, and 
stepping away from horror, Inception grabbed my imagination. Hell, I'd watch a weekly show for The Cabin in the Woods that both mocks and respects the tropes with a new group and a new evil released every week. Or something akin to the Animatrix, expanding these universes with a handful of highly produced shorts. Something like Masters of Horror. And there we go. It's a shame that Masters of Horror is long gone. It helped give a platform to former directors, allowed them to do what they wanted to do without the studios jumping in to curb those intentions. While I love this episode, there were many I've seen that kept me from exploring the entire series. Years later, I can find those worthwhile episodes that play to my interest, and damn, am I glad that I found Ziggurat Burns. What did you think of the series as a whole? Are there any series you'd be interested in being made in this format? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode in particular, how it compares to John Carpenter's other outings, and what you think John Carpenter's best project was. Also, have you guys watched Mick Garris' follow-up series, Fear Itself? How did that compare to Masters of Horror? Thanks for all you do, my fire starters. My name is Justin D. Hurd, and this has been Dubious Consumption. And I'm outro. By brutally murdering a woman. You, sir, you should have masked. Indeed. Indeed. It's time. We have all laid aside disguise but you. I wear no mask. No mask? No mask! Oh, yeah. And this. And this. And this. And this. And this is dubious consumption.